Is Joe Biden ever going to go to Ohio? To East Palestine, Ohio? The question keeps coming up, it keeps mounting, and yet President Joe Biden continues to tap dance on this one. Plus, the first gentleman says he thought long and hard and has been thinking long and hard about what it really means to be a man. Too much of toxicity. It's masculine toxicity out there. Okay, and as Catholics are allegedly being targeted by our own FBI, as the head of the teachers union in New York insists on student loans that must be forgiven, and as we teeter on the brink of World War III, a new poll by YouGov shows an overwhelming number of Americans think Joe Biden is just a little too up there. He is too old for the job. They don't want him to run again. Can you blame him? In today's show, I am being joined by Michael Knowles, host of the Michael Knowles Show over at The Daily Wire. I'm so excited to have him here. I really am because I love his show, first of all, and because he's going to have some tremendous insight for us. And he's funny (laughs) and he's smart and he's Catholic and attends mass in Latin. Oh, dangerous guy, right? <laughs> Listen up, everyone. It's a big show. Welcome. I am Trish Regan. This is a Trish Regan show. We are brought to you in part by Legacy PM Investments. Go to LegacyPMInvestments.com to learn all about investing in gold and silver today or call them 1-866-589-0560. You know inflation is here. You know it's not going away. So how do you protect your dollars? How do you protect the purchasing power of your dollars? That's one of the things that you can look at through an investment in gold. You know, it's been, what, nearly a month? Nearly a month. And still no President Biden on the ground in East Palestine, Ohio. I want to know what's wrong with Ohio. Really, I mean, why can't the guy just buzz over to Ohio? He went all the way to Ukraine, right? We never heard the end of that. The trip that President Biden to to Kiev was uh, historic. It was brave. Many of you talked about how we heard the the sirens wailing uh, in the background as the president was on the ground. Remember, there was there is no military uh, on the ground in in Ukraine. U.S. military on the ground in Ukraine to send a very clear message, not just to the people of Ukraine, not just to Russia, but the world. He went to Ukraine. It was a big deal. You'd think the guy was you know 007 over there. Look, I'm not going to take it away from him. It is rather impressive that he was able to go there without the proper kind of protection, perhaps a little stupid as well. (laughs) But he went over to Ukraine, but he can't make it East Palestine, Ohio. I mean, that's a little troubling. Today, he was asked the question again, hey, buddy, you are going to go? He dodges. Watch. Mr. President, you went to visit Ohio to discuss the situation there with the trade with people there with I've spoken with every official in Ohio, Democrat and Republican, on a continuous basis, as in Pennsylvania. I laid out a little bit in there what I think the answers are. We put them together, and we will be implementing an awful lot into the legislation here, and I will be on the next Yeah, I, I don't think he's going to Ohio. I think you can pretty much forget about it, East Palestine. But you know what? Ohio's not going to forget. And I don't think Americans are going to forget this either. You see, Ukraine is kind of what this administration is all about right now. That is their focus. They're like laser focused on that. And when it's not Ukraine, and how much more money we need to print in order to help keep the country afloat there, when it's not Ukraine, the Biden administration, well, they tend to revert back to the the well, back to some pretty wild social issues, social issues like it's time to totally rethink the definition of what it means to be a man. Even Kamala Harris's first gentleman husband is in on this act. In an interview with MSNBC, the second gentleman was asked whether he had changed his own view about perceived gender roles. Can we just talk about masculinity for a moment? Um, Has being second gentleman changed your own view of perceived gender roles or what it means to be a man? Listen to the answer. Uh, There's too much of toxicity, it's masculine toxicity out there. And we've kind of confused what it means to be a man, what it means to be masculine. Yeah, I'd say you've confused it. I'd say you guys have done a really good job at confusing it. I mean, it's not that hard. It's just that you seem really kind of hell-bent on making sure that young kids don't understand the difference between a man and a woman. 
And, you know, Apple has that pregnant man emoji and uh, everyone suddenly wants to go by they, they. Besides it being just grammatically incorrect, they're totally complicating this. So let me just say, a man, a masculine man, is someone who is a responsible person. A responsible person, a kind person, who looks out for women and recognizes the vulnerability and the specialness, if you would, of women. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with putting a woman up on a pedestal. A man should do that. A masculine man wants to provide for his family, wants to help his community. And as Delta Burke, the actress, once famously said in her sitcom, Designing Women, I think the man should have to kill the book. <laughs> I love that. You know what? I'm all for it. Yes, the man kills the bug. You got that, guys? So you know what, Joe Biden? Go to Ohio. Tie tail it out there. Get your tush in Ohio. Stop spending all of our money on all these wars. Find a diplomatic solution and end this gender nonsense, for goodness sakes, okay? The man kills the bug. Turning to our guest. This is so good to have Michael Knowles in the house today. Michael Knowles with us. He's the host of the Michael Knowles Show over at Daily Wire. It actually happens to be one of my favorite shows. I was just telling him. Michael, it is wonderful to have you. Thanks for being on the show. Like I said, I love the program. I love it. Trish, if I were not so Sicilian and swarthily complexioned, I would be blushing right now. I am so honored <laughs> that you watch the show. I really, really appreciate it. And thank you for having me on. Well, you know, you've got a great combination of intellect, wit, humor. It just comes together very nicely. And when you Stop gotta, it. Go like, on. You know, Go but when on. you got to sit through the news of the day, which sometimes can feel a little terrifying and very concerning. I think having that gravitas plus humor, that counts for a whole lot. So, Michael, I'm glad well, to have you. you here. And people should absolutely go check it out. He's at the Daily Wire with Michael Knows Show. Um, before we get into some of the, the news of the day, and I know you have some thoughts on, on Joe Biden and his age. There's a new poll. Everybody agrees with you, by the way. He's too old to run again. Before we get to that, I just want sort of your, your overall view on what's going on in the world right now. Because I'm actually at the point where I, I start to get a little worried when I see that Catholics are being targeted because the FBI may think that, that they are actually a, a threat to society. I just sit there and say, well, well, who's next? I mean, it's Catholics, then it's evangelicals, then it's Jews, then it's atheists. There's a sense that somebody wants to divide us quite badly and pit us against each other. And it worries me for the future of society. What's your thought? Well, I think of all the threats that the United States faces today, it's the worst drug epidemic ever, 100,000 Americans plus dying per year of drug overdoses. That's 5X what we saw 23 years ago. I think of crime surging in American cities all around the country. I, I see that we're on the brink potentially of World War III when you look at what's happening in Ukraine. And so amid all of this, the Biden administration decides the place we need to focus our federal resources is on uh, infiltrating Latin mass Catholic parishes <laughs> where people are just trying to go to mass on Sunday. This is a little bit of a personal story for me yeah. because I attend a Latin mass parish and I can tell you it, the parishes are filled with violent extremists because <laughs> the Latin mass going Catholics, they tend to have a lot of children, a lot of toddlers shrieking, yelling, crying. It's, it's very extreme and sometimes violent. Uh, this, by the way, this is a relative small minority of Catholics who go to these more reverent traditional masses. And it's, it just tells you everything you need to know about the Biden administration. Uh, in fact, Merrick Garland was asked about this by Senator Cruz on the Hill just recently. And uh, Merrick Garland said, oh, I totally think it's terrible. I found that report from the FBI unacceptable. We're really looking into it. And then Senator Cruz very slyly asked, he said, so... How many agents do you have spying on Catholic churches? And Garland said, oh, I don't know. I mean, I don't think we should have any. And I said, well, you just gave up the whole game, Buster. <laughs> yeah, no, it, it was alarbing. I mean, they had, I think, about 12 churches listed in that memorandum, one of which was in my home state of New Hampshire. I mean, come on. I mean, it, listen, I grew up Catholic. When I was a kid, there were a lot of masses in Latin. I didn't speak Latin, and I didn't understand a lot, but my parents 
who also didn't speak Latin, they liked it because, you know, Michael, it, it, it gave them, I think, a sense of nostalgia because they grew up going to mass in Latin. But now suddenly you're uh, an extremist because maybe well, there, you... Well, go ahead. I think there's actually a fairly sophisticated political reason as to why the Biden administration would want to crack down on the Latin mass, which is this principle, which in Latin is lex orandi, lex credendi, lex vivendi. The idea that the way that we worship, the rituals that we engage with, affect the way that we believe and the way that we live our lives. And so the thing people like about the Latin mass, it's not just the language, that's only part of it. It's that it's more reverent. It's more traditional. The focus is more on God, at less on the people and entertainment and that sort of thing. And so if you are worshiping and engaging in rituals in a way that is more traditional, more conservative, more normal, <laughs> then you're going to have a society that's more of all those things. And unfortunately, liberals and modernists and progressives they don't like that. And so they figure if they can cut off the ritual and the worship, then the belief and the way of life is going to follow. All right. So this is an important issue here because I, I just got to get at why. Like what, what is the end goal? Because we have societal standards and unit, family units, all of this it, it serves a purpose. And it's frankly for the betterment of society, having communities, people that, that respect one another and live by a certain code of ethics, why would they want to just throw that all out the window? Trish, if you keep talking like that, Garland is going to sick the FBI on you. You've got to be very careful with that kind of language. What you're saying is obviously true, and I certainly agree with that. Uh, and, and the left uh, understands that as well. They understand the importance of norms and standards and taboos. They're just trying to undo all the norms and standards of taboos. That's why they've redefined the family. That's why they're now trying to redefine man and woman. That's why they're redefining the origin of the country, not 1776, but 1619, mm -hmm. as the New York, New York Times insists. That's why they're trying to redefine everything. And unfortunately, uh, there are a lot of squishier conservatives who don't want to recognize this fact. They think that a society doesn't need standards and norms, and we can all just do whatever we want to do and live and let live, and as long as it doesn't you know, offend the horses or make me pay for anything extra, go ahead and live your life. But that's not how society works. You know, Man is a social creature. We're, we're a political animal. We're not isolated individuals. And so meanwhile, the left upends all the standards. The conservatives totally concede it, and, and the left gains a lot of cultural ground. Well, it's getting... It's getting a little strange. I mean, the whole thing on the Catholics right now, part of it is, oh, well, you know, maybe these Catholics are too faithful to their church and thus don't believe in the whole LGB. I always get this wrong, so I'm not even going to try, but you know, the whole an acronym. They don't Element believe, OP. thank you. want to say it? I, yeah, I, I always have to LGBT look at it. Element of thank you. One, two, three, There's four. a Q at the end, I think. <laughs> um, but because Catholics don't agree with that, that way of life, Suddenly now they are persona non grata. And I would just say, like, look, Michael, I'm a big believer in people. I, I, again, live for your die in New Hampshire. That's how I grew up. And you do what you want to do, but don't impose it on me. And I shouldn't have to agree with it or be faced with the kind of harassment that people are being faced with, right? I mean, this is still a free country after all. Well, it... it, it it should be. Uh, we, we hope that it's a free country, but uh, increasingly you're seeing that is probably not the case. I remember some years ago when Senator Dianne Feinstein was grilling Amy Coney Barrett, who at the time was up for an appellate judgeship before the Supreme Court, and Dianne Feinstein said, listen, Ju Amy Barrett, you are a Catholic, but you sound like you're a really serious Catholic. The dogma lives loudly within you. And it was a really telling moment. Because what Dianne Feinstein was saying is that when there is a conflict between your faith, in the case of Amy Barrett, it's Catholicism, and the liberal faith, you might pick Catholicism, and that would be really, really bad. Whereas for our prominent Catholic leaders, nominally Catholic at least, Joe Biden and Nancy Pelosi, whenever there's a conflict between Christianity and liberalism, they always pick liberalism on abortion, on marriage, on gender, on all the rest of it. They're always picking liberalism and because liberalism is a jealous God. So we, we want to be tolerant. We want subsidiarity. We like our federal system. We want decisions to be made at the most local level at which they can be competently decided. But we do have to agree 
on some things. If we're going to have a society, when we say words, we got to know what they mean so that we can communicate. We have to know what a man is. We have to know what a woman is. We have to know what marriage is. If we can't agree on those things, then we, we no longer have a society. And so what the left has done is just redefine all of those things. And conservatives haven't mustered much of a vision to counter it. That's alarming because it's going to send us in a direction that I think really ultimately will be a kind of anarchy. I mean, we've seen it, right, during the, the summer of 2020 and the violence that unfolded and this idea that, of course, you can go loot. Go loot that store. They have an insurance company that will pay for it. And by the way, they deserve to be looted. There, there was this sense of entitlement. You're seeing it right now. Randy Weingarten getting up, you know, just having a total meltdown because she thinks that the Supreme Court should vote in favor of Joe Biden sending helicopter money to, you know, gender study grads from Vassar, no offense against Vassar, by the way, it was really intended for the gender studies, I guess, that maybe didn't even graduate. When you've got people in America, hardworking people that actually really are struggling in this new economic environment with very high interest rates. So I don't know why there's such a sense of entitlement other than this is one big engine, this education engine that wants to feed upon itself and continue to spit out kids who can't get jobs, don't have the skills, but have a mindset that's completely in line with what the left wants. Well, this is the fear that the Founding Fathers had and the fear that ancient political philosophers had about democracy, which is that democracy can be a wonderful, very fine thing when the people are ruling for the common good. But then if democracy degrades into mob rule, then people are just going to be uh, passing policy to enrich themselves merely for the private good. And that's what you're seeing with Randy Weingarten. It's amazing the way that this woman gets up there at the Supreme Court, starts shrieking about the idea that Joe Biden can't forgive the student loans with just the stroke of a pen, doesn't even need to put the thing through Congress. And what has Randy Weingarten said? She said that the, when the, the money is coming from the government to the businesses, it's all fine. By the way, that was ratified by Congress. But when the money is going to our students, then it's not fine. But we need to be very clear here. The money we're talking about would not be going to Randy Weingarten's students. Randy Weingarten's the head of the Public Teacher Union. Mm -hmm. For starters, she doesn't have any students. She represents union members, that is public school teachers. But second of all, she's representing people K through 12. I don't think seventh graders have a whole lot of student loans. Really, the, why Randy Weingarten is getting up there shrieking at the Supreme Court is because the people who hold those loans and who have to get not only a bachelor's degree, but a master's degree in many cases, are the teachers, are the union members. So she's once again representing her constituents. You saw this all during the COVID lockdowns. There was a, a conflict between the union members and the students. The students needed to have an education. The union members didn't want to go back to work and wanted to keep getting paid for it. Well, guess which side Randy Weingarten and the teacher union came down on? Obviously, on the side of the members, it deeply harmed students. It harmed their psychology. You saw increases in rates of anxiety, stress, depression, suicidality, and it, it really harmed their education. Uh, now, the silver lining in the storm cloud is that at least the kids weren't being taught gender queer and all sorts of bizarro world No, but ideologies. they were learning it on TikTok. That's true. <laughs> Xi Jinping was covering, coming in where the teachers were, were failing. But it was just su such an obvious personal interest play from Randy Weingarten. And knowing how the Democrats relate to the teacher union, she'll probably get what she wants. Well, and it's also, by the way, very, very different. I mean, her analogy doesn't even make sense. She's saying, well, yeah, you gave it to these businesses. To your point, yeah, that would have been appropriated by Congress. But also, those businesses were shut down out of nowhere, whereas right. those students willingly took on those loans. And I guess there's just no real sense in our country anymore of responsibility, which is a whole other issue. I don't think there's any responsibility among so many of these politicians, Joe Biden being one. You mentioned earlier the threat of World War III. I'm looking at it, and I, I'm someone who actually was an advocate for doing what was needed to assist Ukraine from the beginning. But now I'm looking at the numbers, and I'm an economic business journalist by background, and this is getting alarming. I mean, the, the amount appropriated by Congress, by the way, is nearly the amount that we appropriated over a 20-year period in Afghanistan. We've spent roughly $200 billion. Janet Yellen's over there. She's, she's waving around another check. She said, I got $10 billion more coming in the next three months. That's a lot of money. Again, 20 years in Afghanistan, a total price tag of $300 billion. 
can we afford this? I mean, I, I don't think we, we want Putin over there taking that territory, but simultaneously, isn't there another way here? Shouldn't there be more accountability? I'm a little worried about America's economy. Well, something that I plan to do in the short term is to list Vladimir Zelensky as a dependent on my taxes. I think that's one way that we'll be able to recoup a little bit of the money that we've sent over to Ukraine. The question that we have to ask, though, is what is the money serving? To what end are we sending the money and the guns and the tanks and everything else over to Ukraine? If it is, to your point, Trish, that we want to repel Vladimir Putin, I sure wish that we had kept that strategy in mind before he invaded. I don't think it's any coincidence that Putin did not invade under Trump and he did invade under Joe Biden. And actually, Vladimir Zelensky would seem to blame Biden as well, because Zelensky said that had Biden not taken the sanctions off of Russia, which Trump and Senator Cruz and the, House and the Senate Republicans put on, then Putin would not have invaded. That, that's, those aren't my words. Mm -hmm. That's not Trump's mm -hmm. words. That's Zelensky's words. But OK, we're, we are where we are. You go to war with the army you've got. Where is the off ramp? Are we just headed to a direct shooting war with Russia? That's what would seem to be the case. The NATO secretary general just appeared with the prime minister of Finland yesterday to say that Ukraine is going to become a member of NATO in the long term. First of all, the prime minister of Finland wouldn't make that decision even within her own country. Second of all, Finland is not in NATO. Third of all, do we get a vote on this? Do we get a say? I don't remember the American people having that sort of a debate. And so all I am seeing is this reckless escalation of a war without any particular end in sight. And major, major wars have started over a lot less than we are seeing right now in Ukraine. And unfortunately, our irresponsible leadership just doesn't seem to be heeding those warnings. I keep going back to where's the diplomacy? There, the, where is the diplomacy? See, there's a whole lot of steps that you could be at before you actually start killing people. General Milley said 100,000 deaths on each side, Michael. So both sides are dying. These are people's lives that, that are being lost and we're effectively helping to finance it. So it is alarming, not to mention the fact that the defense minister was thrown out there in Ukraine for corruption. <laughs> Maybe that's why it's costing so much. We're talking with Michael Knowles. He is the host of the Michael Knowles Show. You can follow him on Twitter, at Michael J. Knowles. Let me ask you, because you are, you're funny about this, by the way. You're funny on your show about Joe Biden and his age. Listen, he's never mm. been that sharp. Let's face it. No. He's just never. I, I was going back and looking at old tapes. Remember, he, he was in New Hampshire trying to tell us he graduated top of his law school like a zillion years ago when he first ran for president. And it wound up getting him thrown out of the thing because he was right near the bottom of the law school. He has never been the brightest, period. No. I would just, highly political, clearly, but not an extraordinarily intelligent man. I'm just going to say that. But now it's worse. Now he's up there in age. And according to a new poll, Michael, 68% of Americans think Joe Biden is too old to have another term. What do you say? He certainly is. He's mentally old. He's spiritually old, not with wisdom, just with decrepitude. He, there, there are people who are up there in numbers who are young and vibrant, to use the phrase of Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. Trump has a lot of energy and he's not a spring chicken. Ronald Reagan had a lot of energy during his presidency. Joe Biden simply does not. Trump and Ronald Reagan were sharp as attack right up till the end of their political careers. Joe Biden, as you know, has never been all that sharp and, and now he's even duller than he used to be. What's almost more alarming than that, that the, the fact that we can all agree on that Biden is, is not all there at the moment. The lights perhaps are on, but nobody's home. What, what's more alarming than that is that it doesn't seem to matter all that much. And, and frankly, you can see this right now with Senator John Fetterman. Senator Fetterman had a stroke right before the primary campaign when he was running for Senate. This was mostly kept out of the media. So his family and his political supporters continue to push him to run. He wins the election. He goes to D.C., struggles with all sorts of problems, can barely understand speech, even as reported in the New York Times gets checked into the hospital for more health conditions, now is, is in the hospital uh, uh, apparently for depression. And I understand why John Fetterman is depressed. He's in a very high stress job and he hasn't been given time to recuperate. Well, while he has been in this psych ward isolated at the hospital, according to news reports, John Fetterman has co-sponsored legislation. 
I'm not quite sure how that happens. Do the, does the Senate conduct business from Walter Reed? I don't think so. It's some staff member has just appointed him or herself to be the new senator from Pennsylvania without consulting the voters. And the whole thing just kind of chugs along. So the question that we have to have is, who is actually running the country? Who, in a way, I almost wish that Biden's senility and John Fetterman's health problems would have some kind of deleterious effect on the government because it would show that those positions still matter and they still wield authority. Instead, it's just this kind of background blob, swampy apparatus that keeps on churning like weekend at Bernie's when the figures who are supposed to be engaging in those actions aren't doing anything at all. Well, they don't like it, actually, when you lead. I mean, Donald Trump surely ran into that. He was out in front of a whole lot of stuff. And what happened was you got a new CEO. And when you get a new CEO, things sometimes at the company change. But I I don't think that we're used to that in the political system because people that grow up in that political system know, okay, this is how the game is played. This is what is done. And you kind of fall in line and you, you voice the talking points. Remember when Donald Trump said, yeah, you know, I'm hearing that this virus might have come from Wuhan, China. Have you seen anything at this point that gives you a high degree of confidence that the Wuhan Institute of Virology was the origin of this virus? Yes, I have. Yes, I have. And it's not acceptable what happened. It came out of China. And now what we're doing, Jim, is we're finding out how it came out. Different forms. You know, you've heard all different things. You've heard three or four different concepts as to how it came out. And do you remember the uproar? I mean, it was crazy. How dare you say that? Right. They, they said that any suggestion of something that we all knew was the case was totally unacceptable and racist. People suspected from the beginning that w- the Wuhan virus did not come from a bad batch of bat soup. I think when people realized there was a highly advanced bio lab just down the street from the Wuhan wet market, most normal people put two and two together and said, this seems a little bit suspect. But our leaders told us that we were not allowed to say anything like that. If you voice that opinion on social media, you could be banned. And many people were. If you said this at work you could, or in school, mm-hmm. certainly in the media or in government, you, you would face repercussions for that. So we all, we all know that something's not right, but, but the government won't allow us to say that the emperor has no clothes. And in that kind of an environment, we lose trust in our political institutions. This is why neither party trusts elections right now, B- because it's not it's not the people's fault. It's because the people who are in power have abused their power and they've lost their credibility. This is why we have no faith in the CDC and the WHO and NIH and Dr. Fauci. It's not the people's fault. It's not that they're conspiracy theorists. It's that those institutions have abused their power. They've lied to us. They've lost their credibility. And so the only rational response from the people is going to be a position of skepticism. Well, as they should have right now. I mean, you can't just blindly trust anything. We've learned, unfortunately, the hard way that things are not always as as they seem. All the more reason, by the way, for everybody to watch your show, to go subscribe to the channel on YouTube, to go over to Daily Wire, get uh, more from you there. And of course, you have a website as well, Michael J. Knowles on Twitter. It is good to see you. And we didn't even get a chance to talk about opera, but I just want the audience to know, because some of them, they know that I, I have a a thing about I love opera and used to sing it, but this guy was an opera director. (laughs) So one of these days, we're going to have a great conversation about your favorite composers and your favorite operas. Trish, we'll have to get you on my show and then we can do it. We'll do all the serious news, politics. We'll do that here. Then we'll talk opera over on the Michael Knowles show. (laughs) Hey, it's great to see you. Thank you so much for coming on, Michael. All right. Thank you, Trish. My thanks again to Michael. You can catch him on the Michael Knowles show on the Daily Wire. Go to thedailywire.com and you can watch it there. You can also watch on YouTube. You can download his podcast on Apple Podcasts along with this one. I hope you've done that. And make sure you follow him on Twitter at Michael J. Knowles. So he mentioned uh, the opera thing. I mentioned the opera thing. Yeah, I used to sing. And um, I have a, a dog that, that wants to follow in my, my footsteps, it, it seems. I want you to hear this. That's my baby. That's my baby. That's Fluffy. That's Fluffy. And he's working on it. He's working on that that vocalizing. And and he's getting pretty good. 
Oh. I think one of the reasons he's getting so good and the reason he stays so fluffy is because I feed him a supplement that he takes every day. This is a supplement that is just catching on fire all across the country. People are getting excited about this because they are realizing, you know what, our health matters, but our dog's health. Our dog's health matters too. So this is the stuff that's given Fluffy the ability to hit the high notes, if you would. <laughs> he gets a small helping every day of Rough Greens. Every night, actually, with his dinner, I just sprinkle it right on top. The supplement was created by Dr. Dennis Black. Dr. Dennis Black is a naturopathic doctor who really, really loves dogs. And he's got two beautiful big ones, and he wanted to do everything he could to make sure that his dogs were as healthy as possible. And when you look at the, the back of the package there with some of that pet food, much of which unfortunately comes from China, you start to say, wait a second, is this okay? Well, then I found Rough Greens, and, and this makes me feel good because I look at the back of that package, and I know that my dog is getting all kinds of vitamins, probiotics, digestive enzymes, all the things that he needs, all the nutrients that he needs that, by the way, are different than what we would need, but he needs them in order to live a long and happy and healthy life. And maybe do a little bit of singing along the way. Dr. Black has a free jumpstart trial bag of Rough Greens for you. All you have to do is pay for shipping. Just go to roughgreens.com forward slash Trish, my name. Again, roughgreens.com forward slash Trish. Sign up. I know you're going to love it, but most of all, I know your dog's going to love it. It is going to make a difference. And uh, let me know if you can hit the high notes, okay? <laughs> Great to have you here today. We've got a big show coming up tomorrow. In the meantime, do make sure that you subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Make sure that you are downloading and getting this podcast on Apple Podcasts every single day. And check out my merch at the trishregan.store. Trishregan.store, all the merch. Live free or die. I'll see you next.